How often do we really think about where our food comes from? I don't mean the supermarket or the vegetable vendor where we buy it from, but the place where it is grown or the kind of seeds that are sown and everything that concerns the cycle of crops and the resources that are involved in the production of food. We have what about 2, 3 meals a day and it is not until someone explicitly forces us to think about the origin of our food that we give it any attention. Today I turn to Mexican researcher, architect and activist in her own right, Adriana David, to talk about her work on seed sovereignty and how global and environmental forces have changed the seeds that we sow and the food that we eat. She will also tell us why seed banks need to be democratized and how we can use creative tools to foreground the flaws in our food system. I am Vaishnavi Shukla and this is Architecture of Center, a podcast where we highlight contemporary discourses that shape the built environment but do not necessarily occupy the center stage in our daily lives. We speak to radical designers, thinkers, and change makers who are deeply engaged in redefining the way we live and interact with the world around us. So, Adriana, we're going to talk a lot about food and seeds today so let me begin by asking you what the term food sovereignty means so for somebody who is hearing this term for the first time how do you explain it to them okay yeah it's a quite complicated term it's not used that much something that we hear a bit more often would be food justice or mm-hmm. food security you know because um so let me tell you a little bit about the difference between food security and food sovereignty food security talks about having food on the table mm. you know the un the fao they talk about having availability of food but they mm. never um in the description of food security they never talk about the health the healthy part of the food mm. uh the economic part or impact in the system the political part where does that food come from right it's just about it could be mcdonald's it could be it could be junk food any kind of food that would be um the definition of having food security whereas mm. when you talk about food sovereignty you get to think about the whole network right. that that collaborated or worked for your food to be on the table and that mm. food um in that case you are considering the economical part you're considering um the um, you know the relationships in the um, in the community the community part the political part the healthy part mm. uh the part about labor about health about land ownership for example so it talks it it's considering a a bigger spectrum you know of justice and mm. quality in mm. terms of food mm. you know and so the first uh group of people who started uh who, who coined the term food sovereignty is this group called la via campesina mm. and they started talking about that in 1996 um which is um la via campesina is an international group of peasant and small scale farmers uh who wanted to who wanted to to respond and articulate um um like a common answer to neoliberalism mm. and to the dominant market economy you know and so the objective was to defend their rights the the mm. rights to land and the rights to seed right i'm going to read a little um a very small part of this definition yes, um so that you can understand a little bit better So it says this is from 2007 the declaration of Nieleni in Mali where they gathered together just to uh to declare um food sovereignty the definition of food sovereignty and it says food sovereignty is the right of peoples to healthy and culturally appropriate food produce mm. through ecologically sound and sustainable methods mm. and the rights to define their own food and agriculture systems um so basically 
um, we're talking about control, control of the food that comes to your table, you know, mm -hmm. because um, it could sound a little bit um, obvious, but you know, in 2022, most people, and since more than half of the population of this planet live in urban environments, we don't know where our food comes from. Yeah. And we, sh and, and it's really, it's crazy not to know because this is what feeds us and what keeps us alive, you know? And this is how civilization started from hunting and gathering and starting agriculture, et cetera. And we were really, it was like gold keeping seeds, right? Because it yeah. was our social food. And then suddenly um, capitalism and so, so many things, political, economical, uh, colonialism, so, so, so many things just made us end up in a, in a place where we don't really know how the meat that we eat was you know was uh grown or mm. or produced how the yeah how the vegetables were grown and who was involved in that uh supply chain right so food sovereignty that's why that's why i'm very interested in that it considers so many things and when you start talking about and researching a little bit more about food sovereignty and there's um you know elizabeth hoover who you invited yeah. for women design and um i think she's um so fantastic in yeah. how she explains indigenous food sovereignty for the us you know uh because we're talking about um land tenure and so who owns the land um for native american people um so she says if you don't raise your own food, someone else is controlling your destiny. Mm. Right? So, so I think that very small sentence just explains how important having food sovereignty in yeah. a community is. And, and it also, it's, it's a bit overwhelming because it's considering so many things in this, yeah. in this network, of in, in this supply chain right and we could go we, it's very complicated to understand it all and mm. she also uh, at the end of the meeting the lecture i stayed for a while and i was asking so this term food sovereignty is really broad you know like how can we become food sovereign in the community like i've never heard everybody talks about this concept in a very uh, like aspirational way, like very dream, like we should all aspire to be food sovereign, but how, you know? And she, uh, like really like uh, how many, I, I don't know, how, a step-by-step -step guide, you know? Do we need to save how much, how much water resources, et cetera? I don't know. And she just answered, it depends because it depends on the community. Yeah. And it depends on the scale on the scale of the town and of the place. And it also depends on, I think after a while of studying these, I understand that it also depends on the, the culture of the space, of the community, um, the storytelling. So there's, there's this component that's so beautiful and so sensitive about it, mm. not that uh, that's part of the chain, not that political, but it's part of this network where it considers um, nature's right, rights, you know, more than human communities, multi-species, like all these, these, these beautiful uh, environment of multi-species world that includes soil that I, I love. You know, it's, we, it's, we have so a cool. big question about about soil later on. But what was yeah. striking about the definition that you read, and I think we don't highlight it enough, especially in the day and age that we're living in, is the definition said it's culturally appropriate food. Um, mm -hmm. Now, I mean, you know, we, we have a Japanese restaurant in, I mean, sushi has become like a staple where I'm from, okay? Nobody had heard the word sushi unless you'd been outside till about 
maybe three years ago, like pre-COVID, you know, it's all, it's a relatively new phenomenon. Similarly, anywhere you travel, you you get food from around the world. And we'll, we'll talk about food supply chains and demand and supply over all the world. But we are facing a major crisis, food crisis in the world right now, right? So both in terms of food shortage and unequal distribution. And everything kind of spiraled down and got exacerbated with the war in Ukraine, disrupting the global wheat supply. And I mean, news publications have done tremendous coverage of what happened when the war started, not only in terms of like uh, gas from Russia that a lot of countries denied to use, but also Ukraine accounts for a large portion of wheat that is fed into global supply chain. And when the war started, it's just everything was at a standstill. Um, now, you work a lot with seed banks and seed libraries and have even done a beautiful public installation in Mexico City with modular little terracotta seed containers. I want, I want you to talk a little bit about the role of seeds in the larger food system, because we often don't realize that whatever is growing, wherever it's growing, I mean, sure, there's a tree that will give you some stuff annually, but mm -hmm. all of the seasonal produce that you see every winter, every summer is stuff that needs to be grown with the help of seeds. Like somebody has to go sow the seeds and tend to the plantation and make sure you get the produce. Um, yeah. Help us out. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, you know, my love for, for seeds started um, because my mom has an NGO uh, that's called Canasta de Semillas, so Seed Basket in Mexico mm. uh, for a long, long time. For that. Um, and so she, now she's retired, but she used to create community seed banks in different rural places of Mexico. And mm -hmm. depending on, on the, um, um, on the, um, oh, I forgot the name in English, I'm sorry, um, on the bioclimatic uh, sure. areas, right, mm -hmm. of Mexico. Um, and then, so she would get uh, funds from the government and from many, you know, organizations in Mexico and in, internationally. And because I'm an architect, she was constantly asking me, and I'm very honored to design these seed banks, right? Mm -hmm. But it was like, but we have three months because we need to do these meetings with the funding uh, people. Uh, so we need to be super fast. We don't have time to design. Like, you know, all these- um, Design <laughs> problems. Like, trolling, like always, running always like yeah. the, not having time to really think about what a seed bank should look back should look like today in rural areas right so i applied to these artistic uh grants in mexico from the from the cultural um ministry of mexico which is called fonca to design a um a manual of seed bank building you know just like um the, yeah there are many, you know, like um, sustainably appropriate and, and depending on, on maybe built on straw bale houses or, or earth walls, et cetera. Anyways, along the road when, so I, I got the grant. And so I spent one year thinking about this issue mm. and with my tutors, et cetera. And what we, what we concluded was that we don't need a new seed bank, a new actual building for that. You know how tiny seats are, you know? We don't yeah. really need a new, a new building for that. And, and because sometimes like we all know that architecture can become very oppressive, yeah. you know? And yeah. very, yeah. very oppressive with nature. Sure. But we said, but we need to communicate these problem. Like the first thing, it's not, it's not about building a new building. It's about creating awareness of the, the big issue that seed diversity is dying. We're losing so many, 
so many seed varieties in this world. So as Vandana Shiva says, and also FAO, etc. Before we used to rely on 85,000, 8,500, I'm sorry, varieties of food, you know, and after um, the green revolution and industrial revolution as well, now we only re rely on about eight um, commodity crops, yeah. right? Which is crazy. And this diversity of seeds, well, you know, it existed because because the world is different, our territories are different, climate, our environments are climate, and they were just adapting to these different climatic conditions, these, diverse, these, these different seeds. And of course, with the evolution of, um, of the, the industrial agriculture and the green revolution, et cetera, it was, more, it was easier to have just one variety because, mm -hmm. you know, it, you can harvest it at the same time. You can you can order it with um, thanks to machines, and you can you can use tractors and combine harvester and etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. And it becomes all very very much um, ordered, classified. Mm. Uh, and of course, that it's it's a long talk, but it, it includes fertilizers, agrotoxics. Yeah, and Today, what like the the result of this looking for productivity and high yield is that we have climate change, we have deforestation, you know, all these fertilizers that go to the soil, and, and we have create, GMOs, and we have GMOs, and we have patents, you know, and that's uh, and we have lost these varieties of seeds that actually naturally adapt to the changing climate, right? And this is what really people before the Green Revolution and before the Industrial Revolution as well, really, really kept as gold because it was their source of food, their security, their food security for the next season, you know? There's beautiful examples of seed banks, um, pre-Hispanic pre in Mexico seed banks, uh, one that's called Coscomate from indigenous communities and, and in Africa as well. I like, there's so many, I'm gonna send you images. Uh, they, used to, they used to save seeds in terracotta containers because terracotta is very, um, a great insulation, uh, in, yeah. yeah, material for insulation. And they would put it on the ground. They, were, they would save it, um, they would, separated from uh, from the earth a little bit just to have a little bit of air and avoid plagues and avoid animals etc there were there's such a beautiful technology for saving seeds you know before these um, yeah, these revolutions of the 20th century um, and because they understood the importance of these seed varieties and how important, a localized seed for every community was. Mm. And so, you know, I, I'm telling this story because, because along, like, along this year, I was, when I was starting how to build a seed bank, the only thing I realized is how important and how we should just, we should all save seeds however we can. Mm. And we should all consume diverse, you know, and mostly now because um, because of climate change and how these cl these conditions are changing, we need to be able to grow to still grow food in a changing environment and have seeds. You know, corn has sixty four varieties. Mm. You know, and because one grows in Chihuahua and another one grows in in Merida in the Mayan territory and another one is adapted to this more humid uh, soil and etc like it's not only about soil it's about the whole climatic condition and environment right and we have lost so many so many varieties because of these and because we are also as consumers we keep buying the same tomato you know and the same yeah. type of 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 every produce you know um so i became basically in love with these seeds because they're also physically 
it's so beautiful that such a tiny living being creature can hold the information you know of a huge plant and the evolution of a climate and a soil so that it could adapt and grow better in this following season and it could adapt to a plague and it can and it's continually um you know changing i don't want to say evolving but just adapting to the climate and being resilient so seeds in their beauty and their tiny beings they become they honor or origins you know and these yeah. origins are also cultural origins and so it relates of, to storytelling and talking to to um you know grandparents and and the old people of the community and how they used to um grow this food it's not yeah. about machines and how we understand it today i think and that's the question about machines that i'm really interested about but maybe later we can talk about it but but that also ties so closely i mean you think of seeds as seeds and maybe you don't realize it that explicitly that it's the seed and it's saving or otherwise that leads to change in culinary traditions like an entire society right so once you stop growing a particular thing that once grew there it yeah. it yeah has a top down effect in terms of what you eat what gets passed on uh even in terms of like family recipes from one generation to the other and it's yeah. it's the seed from which the whole thing quite literally emerges um but yes. i also want to tap into something that you mentioned uh early on about soil and and i have a whole question on this so <laughs> this this no this this comes from this very popular recent movement associated with an indian yeah. spiritual guru by the name of jaggi vasudev and he he's yeah. known around the world by sadguru and he's recently started an international campaign called save soil it's it's become kind of a global movement now so he um was on a tour around the world on his bike and is saving so, sorry spreading the message of saving soil and how with the day and age and the way we're treating our land and the soil it's essentially losing its nutritional values and you know we've been abusing the soil that we grow our plants in that we live on it's crazy and uh, it it kind of i mean it it talks about soil health but also climate change in a lot of ways because they're they kind of interrelated and the movement did catch people's attention right so it got a lot of media attention a lot of celebrities got associated with the movement so you, you would have yeah you know people change their instagram profile pictures saying save soil um people were wearing t-shirts celebrities were endorsing it reposting it and every time he would go to a different country he would have um a proper rally there he would have an event with state leaders with ngos with students with children and it seemed to for for once shift the attention from the vague words of climate change social unrest war food xyz to literally soil you know like save yeah. soil that that was like a two two word message now you too have researched and written a fair bit about soil and i found this one thing you wrote in your thesis very profound in the in the document and you kind of ask it's it's a question you <laughs> you ask what is the soul of soil it's very profound do you want to elaborate on <laughs> yeah. that yeah of course so um you know i think there are many scales of let's say a, a, a tackling you know like just going into this into this issue into this problem right and i'm continually like looking away looking for a whale a way to just for me to understand it or maybe just take the 
extract the best of it to 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 create this awareness like this became like my my main my main uh, objective i think the beginning and you saw it with counter meal and also with the seed bank installation it's like I need to understand why we became so disconnected with our so source of food, mm. you know? And I'm trying to find a way to reconnect somehow. Mm. And, and I guess because I also have like this background, I just told you about it, like in, in, in performance, in, in dance, in there's something very like, um, bodily about mm. sometimes the research that I do because I think that when you connect through um through your skin with yeah. some issues it's because and maybe I'm just um, um it's complicated to explain and I'm sorry about that but um there's something about the small scale connection of human beings and nature that I'm really it's really it's a it's about. a tactility it's the yes I don't know if even tactility does justice to it but I know what you mean you know how like young kids when when they go out to play they often don't need toys because they have their hands and exactly engage all of your senses you know your touch yeah. your smell your eyes and kids also like to eat the sand you know it's a little yes. bit of that yeah taste and Ab your mm -hmm. absolutely yeah it's, it's a bodily experience it's a bodily experience i mean it's this like we have a memory that we are also nature mm. you know and that we are constantly talking about nature like on the other side and us humans and that's i think one of the main problems in which we treat, of course, like we know that we treat nature like that because we feel that we are not part of it, right? But, but we're we're part of it, and it's um, I don't know. Thinking about like these Lean Margulies and this symbiosis um, understanding of the world that becomes where human beings become also part of these networks mm. of mutualism. You know, we are also part of that, and we can prove it because of the bacteria that lives in our gut and this interconnection and you know of many many not only bacteria like so many living beings that we don't understand but we know that we rely on them and they rely on us you know so i think soil is a little bit like that like i want to understand it um, a little bit like that in in the sense that agriculture was developed by men like human beings right and these but it's a natural uh, thing that's happening so how do we connect like it started it started with human beings understanding how we connect with nature because mm. nature gives us food right you know so and we give back it's constant exchange and in this exchange and in this symbiosis there's also soil like we cannot forget about soil right but there's um so then i was i was i was exploring how do we connect with soil and how do we understand that soil is alive right and i think it's also the argument uh, of the safe soil campaign it's we cannot think about soil as an inert thing we need to think about it full of living beings and full of activities and full of exchanges of chemical energy and nitrogen and phosphorus and bacteria and protozoa and like it's like so overwhelming when you start uh, researching how alive it is you know and it's working constantly in these exchanges with um with also the cosmos and etc and we are part of it because we started this agriculture thing mm. um you know growing even if uh, um like, I mean, I don't want to use the word domestication, but it's part of we it's part of a mutualistic work. And so finding the soil of soil <laughs> was um, was just trying to make trying to understand agriculture, I guess, 
in a democratic way. Like we are like no hierarchies, human beings, soil, plants, leaves, chemical energy, all the actors are part of the same democratic, you know, like level and balance. So I was trying to, to understand how that worked. And I ended up uh, drawing a choreography, a score, you know, so that our bodies, like we could express this energy through, through a dance. But this is just an exercise, I guess, to understand to understand that we are all connected and we're alive thanks to that we live and we die for that that's i think that's a beautiful quote and i could i could read that short poem that i wrote, wrote Please do. for the choreography <laughs> um let me see it's here um so it goes like this the silent action of the greens versus human machines. We produce energy, dissipate it, transform it. We're bones with cells metabolizing air, starlight and water. Dissipation of energy is what's important. The land we inhabit is cosmos made, not man made. There is silence. Silence of the greens, transforming energy into different forms within this environment. In silence, the different nutrients travel from element to element of earth to allow for the becoming of each plant. In agriculture, there is never dormancy. There is constant activity initiated by human energy. However, it's a free energy. The greens create transform and dissipate energy, each at a different pace. The movements overlap, but never hinder. Each organism allows and supports the development of the other. This is not a solo dance. Dancers feel the lightness of movements. They float in a repetitive but precise sequence. When the sequence is over, the cycles start again. <laughs> so it's 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 talking about a cyclical movement right it's it's in constant motion it has its own life and what i really like about your work adriana i i, I want to emphasize this enough so that it's you know that you've used so many different mediums and methods and instruments at your disposable at your disposal to really talk about the things that you feel strongly about, right? I mean, a part of your work, of course, is is really technical and scientific. I mean, when you when you look at yeah. chasing Milpa, it's a proper methodical research project about the three sisters. It's corn, squash, and uh, corn, bean, and squash. Corn, bean, and squash. So yeah. a lot of your work is looking at the formal systems in place, and you know, you're tracing it yeah. back to the changes in the economy and all of that. But you also often used artistic methods to connect to the subject and this topic. And this is a perfect segue because I couldn't let you go without <laughs> talking about Counter Meal, which was a wonderful performance in the Kirkland Gallery at the GSD. It was um, a dining table where yeah. you and I think it was Ines cooked a yeah. beautiful meal and menu and it was a performance where you were serving food but it was also you'll send us one of the images that we'll use for promotion so that image of the counter meal we'll put it out there but it was yeah. a table with I remember I didn't make the cut uh, for the dinner but I I saw it in the weeks after right the table had soil spewn across it and yeah. you were serving meals like it was a proper coursed dinner and I think you had already put the seeds in in the soil and then you let that table be in that space for the next few weeks and I happened to be there I, mean, I had one of my classes there in um in 40k but I happened to see it a couple of weeks later when after the performance there's like these yeah 
green little um, shoots that were already coming out of the seats. And that table had almost transformed into a mini farmland of sorts. Like, you know, that soil with yeah. that seed had made it a live area. And it was just a table with soil and seeds. But together, yeah. it had a soul. <laughs> and you had the green seedlings outside. Do you want to recap the idea behind Counter Meal? And just, I think also broadly, the larger question here is, using whatever tools we have at our disposal to really spread the word and draw attention and highlight the issues that are often at the background, you know, in the background. So yeah. the question like, where does your food come from? And this is a question even somebody else in the episode when he's talking about a speculative design project where in India he's saying, well, 50 years later, what if a city like Delhi became an agro city? And he also begins in his episode talking about how most people don't know where their food comes from. Like we have zilch. Yeah. yeah, we have no idea. We don't care. It's, it's, it's really impressive. And this is um, where I think I maybe now get it a little bit. This is food security because we have the food, but it's just like, we don't know exactly. where it's coming from. Exactly. Absolutely. So that was, the whole point, because when we started thinking about that um, that performance dinner counter meal, when I started thinking about it, was like my objective was to like communicate this issue. Like, how do I communicate that what we eat is not what we think that we're eating? You know, that it's full of fertilizers, that it's full of uh, it's, it's full of agrotoxics, it's full of injustice, it's full of inequalities, it's full of so many things, no? And at some point, I was thinking, should we, um, should we use all organic produce or all agroecological produce? But then we, it was very complicated to find it, first of all. And second, yeah. and, and anyways, it would be another podcast, but organic food is like, uh, sometimes it's not as um, part of the food sovereignty, you know. Um, it's problematic. Proposal is problematic because it's like, it, it has become so, um, so economic that it relies on monoculture mm. with a little bit, less agrotoxic you know because the policies right now in the united states and everywhere in the world they say that you can grow you can call your food organic if it has a little bit less of this agrotoxic and of this fertilizer but it doesn't mean that it has zero fertilizer i mean zero agrotoxic you can use natural fertilizer of course but um it doesn't mean that so the people who start growing it it's the same thing, it's monoculture, is one seed, one type of variety is, and if we start um, looking the, um, into the, the labor that works in these organic farms, you know, in California, for example, et cetera, it has nothing to do with, with food sovereignty, mm. you know, it's, but anyways, my point with counter meal was we said, well, um, and Christoph was my tutor, Christoph Vodishko, at that point, you know, um, and he's, bold, of course, bolder. And he said, you need to bring the, uh, you need to bring this agrotoxic that we keep talking about and that is, um, should, be, should be forbidden because of the cancer uh, um, issues and like, not only for human beings, but, but for the whole environment where it is sprayed which is called Roundup, glyphosate. You need to bring it in. And, and so we said, and at the same time, I wanted, as I told you before, I wanted people to, to with tactile, with, to touch soil, right? To touch food, to touch. Just, just a little interjection here. But when you, because you're talking about the agrotoxics, this was a few months before COVID, 
and we had no yeah. idea what was coming and you were dressed in a hazmat suit yes totally we That had no crazy. idea what was coming we had no idea it was like five days earlier yeah uh, before the lockdown and i don't know why i threw away those uh those suits <laughs> you know <laughs> but anyways so what um through the idea of of communicating the problem and feeling and trying uh to bring in uh you know the the land the fields the seeds for people to feel what it is you know and not having it across um in rural areas and across yeah. the, um you know so i i covered um what i did is i organized a dinner with a course meal and each course it, it was six or seven courses one two six courses it was elaborate and, yeah <laughs> it had a special um message you know um on where it comes from how it was grown you know and ines helped me with these with these because ines she's a great cook um an amazing artist as well um and we had people sitting in a table full of soil full of seeds for them to touch for losing you know fear yeah. of soil because sometimes we are very nervous of touching soil you, we're not like babies as you say but there's there is this instinct still that we let that, that we need to recover and this uh passion for looking at things growing you know when we had like this exercise at school of growing a bean you know in cotton that's not great but everybody's passionate about that like i don't know one single person that can tell me i hated this exercise i hate looking at things growing that's not true like we love it there's love inside us so we full we cover the table with soil and with seeds and then we put the agrotoxics on top of the um on top of the table you know round up huge you know and it's like you shouldn't eat close to that you shouldn't open it it's very toxic you know but it's still legal and it's patented and that's a full story that probably um um uh, professor vandana shiva will talk about that because you know about patenting seeds and etc which is a huge problem but what we just what i just wanted to talk about is you know you know the guacamole that you're eating there's a huge problem in public policies um and there's uh deforestation in mexico because mm. guacamole became part of this huge trend and um there's a super bowl guacamole there's a so many um um subsidies for that and for importation of of avocado that that's so detrimental to mexican forests right and and also there is a narco issue in this in this problem that is very young but it's because of the demand you know of of avocado and then we had nafta maiz tortillas and i started talking a little bit about what nafta um was um so um and how it um so how it changed uh, it changed the way people were growing food in mexico because it became um easier and cheaper to buy corn from the united states because of these uh international policies of free trade you know and so people um, um peasants in mexico stopped growing corn for uh, for their animals so it became such a huge social conflict that we didn't know about you, you know uh, it's very complicated to understand it when you are just eating a tortilla so I think it was important for me to explain it and maybe I can share the script with you because I'm sure that we don't have enough time for me to explain on the menu but um, um, let me see we had Trump guacamole then we had Lorsban lemon beverage, and Lorsban is one of the most widely used pesticides in the US. Uh, all the lemon is sprayed with that. 
then we had milpa squash. Um, and in that part, I talked about milpa, and the, which is the three sisters for Native American people, yeah. and the importance of these, well, the agroecological part of growing them together, you know. Um, and then we had light potatoes, and I talked about these, um, um, this staple crop in Ireland, um, the potato in the 18th century that um, was, fe was feeding um, almost the entire population of Ireland. And, and then suddenly they got these, uh, how to say in English, um, blight is a disease. Yeah, that, yeah that, had, that infects crops. Uh, you know, that exactly, yeah. that infected the crop. And because they had only one variety of potato, so um, it was it, it it provoked a big famine and almost a million people died of of food shortage. Um, so that's the importance of of diversity, you know, and variety. I think that's what what I wanted to communicate. If we continue to grow diverse, it's not. It sounds very complicated, but it's it's. I mean, I think the answer is simple. You know, it's. Consuming diverse, growing diverse. This is the most resilient act that we can that we can do to tackle. It's not about tackling, but to be to adapt to climate change. And we don't have to be afraid. We just we we can do it. Like we can act. And we and it's just about changing a little bit of the way we eat and returning the love. And as you said, like the culture and the identity of each seed and each, each recipe, mm. you know, and this is what Chasing Milpa talked about, because we are not, it's, this is not new. This is just, we had a, a, a century of, of changing the way we understood food. But if we try to forget about this century, the 20th century, and we go back and try to understand how native communities yeah. understand the relationship of food with human beings and diversity. I think that's such an important part to adapt to climate change. And be yeah, resilient. and I think that's also something that Dr. Shiva talks about, her organization, which is called Navdanya, actually means yes. like nine different types of grains, right? Which, yeah. which comprise the whole constellation of food. What I was looking for when you were talking yeah. about avocado was, there's this Netflix series called Rotten. I don't know if you've seen it. Yeah. But yes. there's an episode on the avocado war. And this I talks about the, uh, so this is season two, episode one. Mm -hmm. And it talks about the shift in just the global perception of avocado as this trendy food. Um, yeah. It's rise avocado to popularity. And yeah. Avocado it's everything. It's rise to yeah. popularity and... Uh, it talks about the mafias and the cartels that got involved in the yeah. avocado distribution cycle. So you could you yeah. could watch it. It's it's a good episode. Yeah, I, yeah, I'm gonna watch it. Yeah, definitely. But and it also talks um, about uh, it, as a part of like you know what you described as food sovereignty. It talks about the flip side in terms of how, especially in places like India where avocado is not indigenous to any of our cuisines okay it's it's yeah. not a part of Indian food but we can get an avocado like if you want to you know exactly so people here have started growing it and it's it's not an it's not a cheap item to buy it's expensive of course yeah. if you trace it back just the amount of resources that go into the production of avocado they don't necessarily trickle down to the farmer and this episode talks about yeah the situation of the farmers and I've seen it long ago but it, it traces it back to like the origins and the whole supply chain but, yeah um, it's very interesting and for every ingredient it becomes the same so um, the one I've researched the more the most is milpa so corn mm -hmm. bean and squash and how you know because corn is part of the um, the grain that fed that feeds um, the continent of uh, the American continent, you know, yeah. since 
um, uh, I don't know, 8,000 years ago when, when corn in the state of corn instead of Teosintle, which was the, um, uh, the original crop um, evolved and changed. And the way American consumption in terms of the United States have shifted into wheat, for example, because wheat was, uh, was brought during uh, colonialism, you know, and, and they just sent corn to feed the cows and to feed the, um, the animals, cattle. Uh, it changed it, it changed completely our demand of corn and our demand of wheat, you know, and then we have countries like Ukraine, which is on the other side, growing wheat for other countries. And it's also because of the demand. And yeah. of course it's a grain, you know, and we need to, it's different to talk about grains and the other seeds because grains um, have a more intense um, um, set of nutrients, you know, like rice and wheat and corn. So it's different and we depend on them to survive. Um, but it's very strange how these trends and these um, uh, colonies and history has made us change the way we eat, you know, yeah. and the food that comes from. Yeah, yeah, that's... Um, I have one it's... last question for you. <laughs> <laughs> What's next for you and what are you working on? <laughs> um... You know, I really liked my my last research that I um, I I got to do thanks to the Mellon Grant, which is called the Architecture of Food Sovereignty, mm -hmm. and how how I started I started with the with the research of Milpa in Mexico City, and really trying to trying to understand physically and in terms of architecture and the built environment, what does it mean to be food sovereign. And what does it mean not to be, not to have food sovereignty? Um, so I've been researching that in Mexico City. And, you know, I've, I'm very interested in the way buildings and architecture can become so oppressive and change um, the way food supply chain and change, uh, change in a city and how it can become oppressive with peasants because they don't, they cannot, um, in Mexico City, there's a wholesale market called Central de Abastos, which is huge. And it receives 325 tons of, of food every day, um, 50,000 trucks, like so much food, enough to feed Berlin or Madrid every, every day. And, you know, only the big, uh, the big, um, um, how to say, um, the big industries of mm. food, you know, can arrive and can get to sell the food in these places because small peasants, they can't even afford for these, for the truck to bring their food because they have so, such a little and small scale production, you know, that it's not um, economically, it, it economically doesn't work. Mm. So, um, I keep thinking, where did we end up designing and building these wholesale markets, you know? And this, this is a very important architect in Mexico who designed it. And, and I think we have a responsibility of, as architects, you know, to think about a honest program and to think about a democratic and a just uh, architectural program for the next buildings that we, that we work on, you know? And try changing the way things work yeah. and if this architect had thought about or had proposed maybe another way of of having food supply in Mexico City that allowed for small peasants to arrive to another types of wholesale places or storages and and maybe it would have been different and you know so I'm thinking, I'm thinking um, of focusing my work on these 
architectural places, you know, and thinking about an architecture that is more food sovereign. Mm. And yeah. <laughs> yeah. It was great catching up with you, Adriana. Thank you so much for sharing your work. Thank you. Thank you so much for inviting me. This is <laughs> such a beautiful project. Special thanks to Ayushi Thakur for the research and design support and Kahan Shah for the background score. For guest and topic suggestions, you can get in touch with us through Instagram or our website arcofcenter.com. That is A R C H O F F C E N T R E. And thank you for listening. <laughs>